small. Did you ever, I mean, I was always curious, have you ever cheated on a test? Oh yeah, one of the things, <laughs> not exactly that, but one of the things I felt guilty about all my life, if you really want to know. Professor Chomsky, you have inspired uh, youth, you, you, you've inspired people, uh, you've inspired thinkers, you've inspired me. And that same inspiration, love of learning, love of education is exactly what I think is lacking in the education system. Um, my, I mean, the revelation for me was when I uh, did well in school, it was usually at the expense of not picking up a newspaper. When I did well at school, it was usually at the expense of not knowing about global culture, global international relations. It was usually at that expense. I'm just curious, as, as a youth, when, when you were a child, um, elementary school, uh, was there a, a point um, in your childhood where you thought that education, or school rather, was the biggest hindrance to your education as opposed to it being an agent? Well, I was lucky. I, uh, from actually age two, my parents were teachers, so I was in nursery school from age two and uh, on to around 12 when I went to high school. I was in a uh, Deweyite experimental school run by Temple University, which had a, a very progressive education uh, department, and they ran a, a Deweyite school, which was fantastic. So it wasn't an impediment to anything, it was a stimulus. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of encouraged to uh, do creative work, to work with other people. There was no grading, I, I had no concept of, I mean, I, I didn't know I was a good student until I got to high school, mm -hmm. literally. Um, I went to an academic high school where everyone's graded, and, you know, all that sort of thing. But uh, I, mean, I knew I had skipped a class, but and everyone else knew, but that just meant I was the smallest kid in the class, didn't mean anything else. Right. So there was, there was no com competition, no grading. You were a lot of encouragement. To, you know, I wouldn't say everything was perfect, but uh, it was a very stimulating environment, and I got interested in all kinds of things. Right. I mean, that, that's a very interesting point because I, I think it, that fits into the concept. Um, do you think that I mean, collaboration and competition can coexist in the educational um, really realm? Well, they can, but there's just no point in competition. Mm. Uh, what's the point of, like when my kids went to school, they went to a, what's well, considered a good school in the Boston suburbs, but by the time they were in third grade, they were ranking other children as smart and dumb hmm. because they were being tracked, so he's dumb, you know, he's on this. I mean, is there any point to that? I mean, it's demeaning for everyone, it's harmful to everyone, it serves no educational purpose. Uh, in the school that I was in, it wasn't that all the kids were by any means gifted. There were a lot of kids there who were sent there because they were behavior problems. The public schools couldn't handle it. So it was quite a mixture, but there was no, you know, people were encouraged to do their best when you helped other people. Do you think with that model, do you run into problems when it comes to not understanding where you are in terms of your um, improvements, whether your, 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 your judgments on, on that? There are the problems that a child has growing up, but uh, I, I don't remember any sense of that. I mean, there were tests, so you sort of knew how you were doing, and uh, if there was a problem, you know, the teacher talked to you and try to work out the problem. But uh, the tests weren't for ranking; they were for improvement. So to find out what I have to do better, you know, that sort of thing. Oh, mm, I see. Um, do you think that? I mean, this is the long-standing debate. Do you think that in education, schools, is it their responsibility to give students a broad stroke of information? Or, I mean, more and more we're seeing students are being funneled into an area of specialization um, and, and are being told to stick to that, do the best you can in that, because uh, that's, that's where the jobs are. You have to be the best at what you're doing. Well, as far as giving information is concerned, I think that doesn't mean much. I mean, you have to learn how to gain information when you need it. There's no. I mean, there's a famous physicist uh, at MIT, world famous physicist, who was well known because he taught his fresh, fresh, uh, senior faculty teach freshman courses. That uh, he was famous because in his freshman course, if a students would ask him, "What are we going to cover?" 
he would say, it doesn't matter what we cover, it matters what you discover. Mm. If you learn how to discover, it doesn't matter whether you've memorized this, that, and the other thing. Mm. Uh, you, in fact, one other famous scientist here is an old friend, a Nobel laureate, uh, it, it taught his undergraduate courses. He said without, or even his graduate courses, without himself reviewing the material, he just lectured on the way he thought it ought to turn out and the class was encouraged to research it and mm. see if he was right or where he was wrong and to correct it and so right. on. Now that's the way sh teaching should be. There's no, you know, there's an old uh, image back to the Enlightenment which was disparaged of uh, the idea that uh, teaching should be like pouring water into a vessel mm. and then the vessel pours it back in the form of a test and uh, we've ha all had experiences like that, and we know that it's a very leaky vessel. And furthermore, you can have the vessel completely full. You can study, you have to take some course that you're just not interested in, and it's all boring. And you can study hard to pass the exam, and you did fine in the exam, and a week later you forgot what the course was about. That's exactly that. It happens all the time. So providing information, of course, you know, it's part of education, but it's not the goal of education. The goal should be to develop the, not only the capacity, but also the desire to gain the information that you need and what you're interested in and want to pursue. Mm -hmm. As far as specialization versus the general interest, that's a, pe people are different. You know, mm -hmm. they should they do the kinds of things that are good for them. Right, right. So for some people it may be that focusing like a laser on some topic is what really excites sure. them and um, they can do well at it. And for others it may be on having a general understanding of the world. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any general answer. Do you, th do you think we need teachers in this process? I mean, in this evolving world of, of I mean, technological integration, do you think that we need teachers at the helm of uh, giving students these skills that you, that you speak of instead of just giving out information? Or, or really is that the role of the teacher is, 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 is diminishing, would you say that? I wouldn't say it's diminishing, I think it's being driven out of the educational system. So if you look at programs like the kind of teaching to test programs, uh, No Child Left Behind, uh, you know, uh, Race to the Top or whatever it's called, which is all grading. It's also driving uh, to assessment and ranking, not only of the student, but also the teacher. Uh, that's very destructive of the capacity to, of uh, real education. I, mean, I, I have talks with teachers, give talks with teachers occasionally, and um, some of them have, you can, you can see, there are very creative teachers, but, it's, but they're barred from being creative. Yeah. Uh, so for example, um, I gave a talk a couple months ago, at, uh, then a teacher came up afterwards, sixth grade teacher, told me that uh, just, she said that after one of her classes, mm -hmm. a kid came up and went talk to her and said that uh, she was really interested in something that came up, could she get some ideas about how to pursue it? And the teacher had to tell her, you can't do that, you have to study for the MCAS you know, exactly. the test, and uh, uh, the, the, the child's what happens to the child depends on that, yeah. and what happens to the teacher depends on it. Yeah. I mean, that is kind of pathological, you know. It's um, destructive, right? I mean, yeah. in, in, in some sense, I, I see it destructive to learning um, course, yeah. itself. I mean, real learning means gaining both the capacity and the interest in discovering. If you don't have the interest, you're not going to learn anything. Yeah. Do you think we're doing anything right in the education system? I can't say everything, <laughs> but, but, uh, but the general thrust of it, I think, is uh, undermining education, and I think that's purposeful. I mean, not that somebody says in my mind, I want to destroy education, yeah. but they have goals in mind which are destructive of education. And so this is true at the higher education level. Yeah, it's too. purposeful. Well, you know, it's, uh, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a series of articles in the London Review of Books about the British system by Stefan Collini, a good commentator, mm -hmm. and he was discussing what the Cameron government is doing to the higher education system. And he 
what it amounted to in his final conclusion captured it is they're trying to turn first-rate universities into third-rate commercial enterprises. Mm -hmm. And yes, that's the thrust of commercialization of education. So you're supposed to study what that can increase your human capital, mm. you know, make you make more money. So you, a student is supposed to figure out what to do on the basis and uh, on the basis of what's going to make get me to make more money, and then there's all kind of economic theories about it. And as far as the government is concerned, there, as they say, you know, it's if if a department and a university can't support itself, there's no reason to ask the taxpayer to support it. Mm. So if the medieval literature department can't sell itself on the market, why have it? Mm. I mean, as if the sole goal of education is to maximize profit, individual or general. I mean, that's part of the whole uh, neoliberal pathology. All of life is, is, is supposed to be reconstructed that way. And also, you're supposed to drive out of people's heads the idea that you should care about someone else. That's a dangerous idea. Right. You're supposed to be concerned with yourself, your own welfare, maximizing your own welfare, and then come various mythologies about how you know the public good is the benefits from this, which yeah. of course doesn't. And one part of this is that public education is really a kind of an anomaly from that framework of thinking. Public education is based on the idea, say that, I mean, like say, take me. I don't have children in school. I don't even have grandchildren in school. They're mm -hmm. too old. So why should I pay taxes? Mm -hmm. um, well, why should I care if the kid across the street goes to school? Right. Uh, that's what a public s school system is. It's based on the idea that I should care. Sure. It's part of just a, the responsibility of being part of a community. Absolutely. But if you take the kind of Thatcherite doctrine, there, aren't, there is no society, there's just individuals, why should I care? Yeah. Like in the United States it's called for some crazy reason libertarianism. <laughs> it's a very anti-libertarian, <laughs> but then every, I mean Adam Smith would be shocked, but, uh, but, it, but that's the ideal. Right. And uh, the, it, under that framework, why should public schools exist? Mm. It, I mean, should, it should be privatized or it should have vouchers. Mm. I mean, all, uh, or you should have charter schools. Uh, all of these are mechanisms for destroying the public, public education. Cool. And in fact, mass public education was uh, one of the real contributions of America, of the United States to world culture in the, starting the late 19th century. It was pretty much pioneered in the United States. Uh, it wasn't perfect, a lot of things were wrong with it, but uh, it was the right idea. And it's now under serious attack uh, along with other forms of uh, 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 social responsibility. I mean, take, say, the attack on Social Security. Why attack Social Security? Be reason? Why should I pay because the widow on the other side of town uh, is starving? So it was her fault. She married the wrong husband, or she didn't make a good investment, or she didn't work hard enough. But it's none of my business. Mm -hmm. So why should I pay for her Social Security? Right. I mean, it is. It's a, there's a friend of mine who's a sociologist who right. just wrote a book called uh, The Sociopathic Society, and I think he's right. There's an element of strong drive to turn the society into pathological structures, which incidentally are also having the consequence of destroying the species, uh, because uh, <laughs> under the current moral calculus. If you're, say, the CEO of a corporation, uh, it is far more significant for you to uh, gain a, a bigger uh, 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 bonus in the next quarter right. than to have your grandchildren survive. So therefore, you'll work to maximize uh, climate destruction. Right. And that's taken for granted. Right. I mean, all this, to me, uh, it doesn't sound too much. I mean, I, I'm not very optimistic. Um, do you think that there is, I mean, is there a solution to this? I mean, will, will, will this end? Who, I mean, who should be driving this? Because to me, this doesn't sound like it's ending up in, 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 in the proper place. Well, we happen to be in a pretty regressive period, but there have been such periods before. So, for example, take the United States. Uh, the period now is sort of similar to the 1920s or the 1890s, even statistically. 
inequality and so on. But uh, uh, there were popular forces that arose and broke out of it. Uh, one of the problems now is we don't have a lot of time. Okay. Uh, and that's because the nature of the threat is far more severe than was recognized before. You know, you could have, with great prescience, recognized it at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, but nobody did. Uh, however, in the last uh, several decades, uh, anyone who doesn't recognize it is uh, living in a dream world. So some of the problems which are inherent in these kind of uh, you know, neoliberal societies are really lethal. Right, right. Do you think, um, I mean, just scaling it back and, 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 and looking um, to the future, what do you think education will look like in the year 2030? It depends on what the society will look like. What do you think that'll be? I mean, it's a vague if, question. If I, I mean, was standing on Mars looking at the human species, and I would conclude that they're just an evolutionary error, <laughs> that they've developed the capacity to destroy themselves and almost everything else, and they're doing it. Huh. I mean, when, say, uh, Harper, uh, says, let's maximize the use of tar sands. Uh, he's uh, <laughs> saying, yeah, let's destroy the species. Uh, when President Obama, the other, supposedly the other end of the spectrum, uh, gives a speech, as he did not long ago, in which he says he boasts uh, about how uh, more uh, oil is being taken from the uh, soil under my administration than, you know, any other one, uh, we've now got pipelines crisscrossing the country, uh, covering everything. Yeah. We're going to have a, a be the Saudi Arabia of the 21st century. Uh, he's issuing a death knell for the species. Mm. And then you look at Rob Ford. Mm. And then you look at Rob Ford. Uh, the Rob, Rob Ford, the mayor of Toronto. And then oh, you see yeah, all no, his no. <laughs> shenanigans, right? He looks kind of <laughs> minor as compared to this. <laughs> oh, but, uh, At least he's entertaining, right? But uh, we're, we're doing it. And in fact, it's pretty striking that, uh, that not only are we doing it, but at the centers of power, where real concentration of wealth and power is, right. there are massive efforts to try to undermine the excessive rationality of the public, mm -hmm. literally. And that goes right into the educational system. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, there's an organization called ALEC, you know. Sure, yeah, yeah. You know them, the American legislature, they write legislation for states. Uh, you can imagine, it's corporate run things, you can imagine what the legislation is. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, they have a program now to teach critical thinking in the schools. Who could be against that? Uh, and they've got a couple of states to accept it, and more will. How do you teach critical thinking? Uh, if an uh, uh, elementary school class has a discussion of climate change, you should also include a section on climate change denial. Hmm. That teaches critical thinking. Okay. And it's obvious what they're up to. They're saying, let's try to get the public not to believe what's happening. Right. And to say, let's get them not to believe what's happening is to say, let's try to destroy the possibilities for life for our grandchildren. And that's considered the right thing to do if you can make more short-term profit out of it. Uh, Canada by now is worse than the United States, <laughs> literally. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Canada is becoming the scourge of the planet. And it's not just tar sands. Mm. Uh, take, say, mining, mm. which is heavily concentrated in Canada. Mm. Uh, these mining operations around the world are extremely destructive. Mm. You know, you set up a gold mine in El Salvador, it destroys everything around. Mm. But you got to make money, so who cares? Did you guys get that? Um, I'm, I'm interested to... Um, one more thing about... Uh, you touched upon critical thinking. Do you, and, and I'm actually afraid to ask this question, you being the, moder uh, the, the father of modern linguistics. Um, do you think there's too much focus on numeracy and literacy in um, school? On numeracy and literacy in school? No, I think numeracy and literacy are skills that you have to obtain. Right. But uh, there's all kinds of ways of doing it. I'll take, say, my own school. When I was a kid, the educational doctrine was 
that you were not supposed to learn to read until first grade. That was considered so the same with the Dewey High School where I went. So my parents never taught, taught you know, we'd never encouraged us to, I mean, we read, you know, they'd read books to us. We weren't supposed to learn how to read. Right. And in fact, for some strange reason, the in my first grade class, uh, the boys couldn't learn how to read. There must have been some problem with the teacher. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, you know, we came, like, I happened to get whooping cough, which in those days kept you home for six weeks. Right. So my mother oh. taught me how to read. But <laughs> uh, if it hadn't been for that, I might not know how to read. Well, that would have been... And yeah. nowadays, you, kids, like our kids, and my grandchildren, they were reading by the time they're three or four. You know? I mean, considering how many books you have here, it'd be pretty tough to get through them if you didn't know how to read. You know? well, so. yeah. <laughs> but you have to... So there are a lot of ways to do it, but it certainly has to be done. Yeah. And the same with, uh, you know, arithmetic and the sure. basic skills for existing in the world. Uh, for that matter, now uh, running a whole, having a computer, and uh, and I don't think that's hard to do. In right. fact, my grandchildren do it better than I do, way better, because for them it's kind of like uh, a native language. Yeah. So, uh, okay. but uh, so I think it, it, it's uh, it doesn't take. I mean, these are things that children want to do. You can prevent them from doing it. Like if, if it hadn't been for the educational philosophy of my childhood, I would have wanted to learn how to read at four. That could have easily done it. But it was just, you didn't do it. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, there was, a, up until pretty recently, there was a, an ideology that for uh, deaf children, they should not be taught sign. They should be taught lip reading, and uh, uh, the kids were seriously deprived. Uh, it, uh, it, parents were taught not even to gesture to the children because they have to not create sign, uh, learn sign, which uh, means the same as saying don't learn a language. And it was very harmful. Well, in fact, there were some striking results that were discovered. Uh, for example, there's one case, very good psychologist in Philadelphia, who happened, they happened to find three kids about four years old, uh, cousins, all deaf, who played together, and their children, their parents were indoctrinated into this uh, no gesture uh, culture. But it turned out the kids had invented a sign language. And it was very, when they were found, it was, they were at the level of ordinary children, same, yeah. same structures. It's well, just kind of like it's inside you. Right. You'll do it if there's an opportunity. And if the external environment, Adam Smith would be shocked, but uh, but it, but that's the ideal. Right. And uh, the, it, under that framework, why should public schools exist? Mm, it, I mean, should, it should be privatized or it should have vouchers mm. I mean, all, uh, or you should have charter schools. Uh, all of these are mechanisms for destroying the public public education. Well, and in fact, mass public education was uh, one of the real contributions of America, of the United States to world culture in the starting the late 19th century. It was pretty much pioneered in the United States. Uh, it wasn't perfect, a lot of things were wrong with it, but uh, it was the right idea. And it's now under serious attack, uh, along with other forms of uh, 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 social responsibility. I mean, take, say, the attack on Social Security. Why attack Social Security? Be reason? Why should I pay because the widow on the other side of town uh, is starving? So it was her fault. She married the wrong husband, or she didn't make a good investment, or she didn't work hard enough. But it's none of my business. Mm -hmm. So why should I pay for her Social Security? Right. I mean, it is. It's a, there's a friend of mine, who, a sociologist, who right. just wrote a book called uh, The Sociopathic Society. And I think he's right. There's an element of strong drive to turn the society into pathological structures, which incidentally are also having the consequence of destroying the species. Uh, because uh, <laughs> under the current moral calculus, if you're, say, the CEO of a corporation, uh, it is far more significant for you to uh, gain a, a bigger uh, a 
you know, this bonus in the next quarter right. than to have your grandchildren survive. So therefore, you'll work to maximize uh, climate destruction. Right. And that's taken for granted. Right. I mean, all this, to me, um, it doesn't sound too much. I mean, I, I'm not very optimistic. Um, do you think that there is, I mean, is there a solution to this? I mean, will, will, will this end? Who, I mean, who should be driving this? Because to me, this doesn't sound like it's ending up in, 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 in the proper place. Well, we happen to be in a pretty regressive period, but there have been such periods before. So, for example, take the United States. Uh, the period now is sort of similar to the 1920s or the 1890s, even in statistically inequality and so on. But uh, uh, there were popular forces that arose and broke out of it. Uh, one of the problems now is we don't have a lot of time. Okay. Uh, and that's because the nature of the threats is far more severe than more and more, we we're seeing students are being funneled into an area of specialization um, and, and are being told to stick to that, do the best you can in that, because uh, that's, that's where the jobs are. You have to be the best at what you're doing. Well, as far as giving information is concerned, I think that doesn't mean much. I mean, you have to learn how to gain information when you need it. There's, no, I mean, there's a famous physicist uh, at MIT, world famous physicist who was well known because he taught his fresh, freshman, his senior faculty teach freshman courses. That, uh, he was famous because in his freshman course, if a students would ask him, "What are we going to cover?" he would say, "It doesn't matter what we cover; it matters what you discover. Mm -hmm. If you learn how to discover, it doesn't matter whether you've memorized this, that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you." In fact, one other famous scientist here was an old friend, a Nobel laureate, uh, it, it taught his undergraduate courses. He said without, or even his graduate courses, without himself reviewing the material, he just lectured on the way he thought it ought to turn out, and the class was encouraged to research it and mm -hmm. see if he was right or where he was wrong and to correct it and so right. on. Now that's the way should, teaching should be. There's no. You know, there's an old uh, image back to the Enlightenment, which was disparaged of uh, the idea that uh, teaching should be like pouring water into a vessel, and then the vessel pours it back in the form of a test. And uh, we've ha all had experiences like that, and we know that it's a very leaky vessel. And furthermore, you can have the vessel completely full. You can study, you can take some course that you're just not interested in, and it's all boring. And you can study hard to pass the exam, and you did fine in the exam, and a week later you forgot what the course was about. That's exactly that it. It happens all the time. So providing information, of course, you know, it's part of education, but it's not the goal of education. The goal should be to develop the, not only the capacity, but also the desire to gain the information that you need and what you're interested in and want to pursue. Mm -hmm. As far as specialization versus the general interest, that's a, pe people are different. You know, mm -hmm. they should uh, they should do the kinds of things that are good for them. Right, right. So for some people it may be that focusing like a laser on some topic is what really excites them sure. and um, they can do well at it. And for others it may be on having a general understanding of the world. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any general answer. Do you, th do you think we need teachers in this process? I mean, in this evolving world of, of I mean, technological integration, do you think that we need teachers at the helm of uh, giving students a thing about, uh, you touched upon critical thinking, do, and, and I'm actually afraid to ask you this question, you being the, uh, the, the father of modern linguistics, um, do you think there's too much focus on numeracy and literacy in um, school? On numeracy and literacy in school? No, I think numeracy and literacy are skills that you have to obtain. Right. But uh, there's all kind of ways of doing it. I'll take, say, my own school. When I was a kid, the educational doctrine was that you were not supposed to learn to read until first grade. That was considered so the same with the Dewey School where I went. So my parents never taught, taught you know, we'd never encouraged us to. I mean, we read, you know, they'd read books to us, but we weren't supposed to learn how to read. Right. And in fact, for some 
strange reason, the, in my first grade class, uh, the boys couldn't learn how to read. There must have been some problem with the teacher. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, you know, we came, like, I happened to get whooping cough, which in those days kept you home for six weeks. Right. So my mother uh -huh. taught me how to read. But uh, if it hadn't been for that, I might not know how to read. Well, that would have been. And yeah. nowadays, you, kids like our kids or my grandchildren, they are reading by the time they're three or four. You know? I mean, considering how many books you have here, it'd be pretty tough to get through them if you didn't know how to read. You know? yeah. so. <laughs> but you have to. So there are a lot of ways to do it, but it certainly has to be done. Yeah. And the same with, uh, you know, arithmetic and the sure. basic skills for existing in the world. Uh, for that matter, now uh, running a whole, having a computer. And, uh, and I don't think that's hard to do. In right. fact, my grandchildren do it better than I do, way better, because for them it's kind of like uh, a native language. Yeah. Know? So, uh, but uh, so I think it, it, it's uh, it doesn't take. I mean, these are things that children want to do. You can prevent them from doing it. Like if if it hadn't been for the educational philosophy of my childhood. I would have wanted to learn how to read it for. That could have easily done it, but it was just you didn't do it. I mean, it's like uh, you know, there was a, up until pretty recently there was a an ideology that for uh, deaf children they should not be taught sign; they should be taught lip reading, and uh, uh, the kids were seriously deprived. Uh, it, uh, it, parents were taught not even to gesture to the children because they have to not create sign, uh, learn sign, which uh, means the same as saying don't learn a language. And it was very harmful. Well, In fact, there were some striking results that were discovered. Uh, for example, there's one case, a very good psychologist in Philadelphia who I. Uh, from actually age two, my parents were teachers, so I was in nursery school from age two and uh, on to around 12 when I went to high school. I was in a uh, Deweyite experimental school run by Temple University, which had a, a very progressive education uh, department, and they ran a, a Deweyite school, which was fantastic. So it wasn't an impediment to anything, it was a stimulus. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of encouraged to uh, do creative work, to work with other people. There was no grading. I, I had no concept of. I mean, I, I didn't know I was a good student till I got to high school. Mm -hmm. Literally, um, I went to an academic high school where everyone's graded, you know, all that sort of thing. But uh, I mean, I knew I had skipped a class, but and everyone else knew. But that just meant I was the smallest kid in the class. It didn't mean anything else. Right. So there was, there was no com competition, no grading. You were a lot of encouragement. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say everything was perfect, but uh, it was a very stimulating environment, and I got interested in all kinds of things. Right. I mean, that, that's a very interesting point because I, I think it, th that fits into the concept. Um, do you think that I mean, collaboration and competition can coexist in the educational um, really realm? Well, they can, but there's just no point in competition. Mm. Uh, what's the point of, like when my kids went to school, they went to a, well, it's considered a good school in the Boston suburbs, but by the time they were in third grade, they were ranking other children as smart and dumb hmm. because they were being tracked. So he's dumb, you know, he's on this. I mean, is there any point to that? I mean, it's demeaning for everyone. It's harmful to everyone. It serves no educational purpose. Uh, in the school that I was in, it wasn't that all the kids were by any means gifted. There were a lot of kids there who were sent there because they were behavior problems. The public schools couldn't handle it. So it was quite a mixture, but there was no, you know, people were encouraged to do their best yeah. and you helped other people. Yeah. Do you think with that model, do you run into problems when it comes to not understanding where you are in terms of your um, improvements, whether your, 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 your judgments on, on that? There are the problems that any child has growing up, but uh, I, I don't remember any sense of that. I mean, there were tests, so you sort of knew how you were doing, and uh, if there was a problem, you know, teacher talked to you and try to work out the problem. But uh, the tests weren't for ranking; they were for improvement. So to find out what I have to do better, you know, that sort of thing. Oh, I see. Um, do you think that? I mean, this is the long-standing debate. 
Do you think that in education, schools, is it their responsibility to give students a broad stroke of information? Or, I mean... The, the idea that the teaching should be like pouring water into a vessel, and then the vessel pours it back in the form of a test. And uh, we've ha all had experiences like that, and we know that it's a very leaky vessel. And furthermore, you can have the vessel completely full. You can study, you can take some course that you're just not interested in, and it's all boring. And you can study hard to pass the exam, and you did fine in the exam, and a week later you forgot what the course was about. That's exactly that's, it. It happens all the time. So providing information, of course, you know, it's part of education, but it's not the goal of education. The goal should be to develop the not only the capacity, but also the desire to gain the information that you need and what you're interested in and want to pursue. Mm -hmm. now, as far as specialization versus the general interest, that's a, pe people are different. You know, mm -hmm. they should they should do the kinds of things that are good for them. Right. Right. So for some people, it may be that focusing like a laser on some topic is what really excites sure. them. And, um, they can do well at it, and for others it may be on having a general understanding of the world. Mm. I don't think there's any general answer. Do you, th do you think we need teachers in this process? I mean, in this evolving world of, of I mean, technological integration, do you think that we need teachers at the helm of uh, giving students these skills that you, that you speak of instead of just giving out information? Or, or really is that the role of the teacher is, 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 is diminishing? Would you say that? I wouldn't say it's diminishing. I think it's being driven out of the educational system. So if you look at programs like the kind of teaching to test programs, uh, No Child Left Behind, uh, you know, uh, Race to the Top or whatever it's called, but, which is all grading. It's also driving uh, to assessment and ranking, not only of the student, but also the teacher. Uh, that's very destructive of the capacity to of uh, real education. I, mean, I, I have talks with teachers, give talks with teachers occasionally, and um, some of them have, you can you can see, there are very creative teachers, but it's but they're barred from being creative. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, um, I gave a talk a couple of months ago. At, uh, then a teacher came up afterwards, sixth grade teacher, told me that. Uh, just, she said that after one of her classes, mm -hmm. a kid came up and went to talk to her and said that uh, she was really interested in something that came up. Could she get some ideas about how to pursue it? And the teacher had to tell her, you can't do that. You have to study for the MCAS you know, exactly. the test. And uh, uh, the, the, the child's, what happens to the child?